I love a good dinner party. It's a great way to see friends, to eat good food, play a board game or two, and then head home to sleep. I mean, what's not to love? Well, apparently, there are quite a few things in historical banquetry that weren't of this fun and hearty nature. Instead, it seems that there was an occasional trend in wealthy circles specifically to up the ante, so to speak, and either trick their guests into believing one thing when, in fact, entirely another thing was true, or making them believe that they were about to face actual real death at any given moment. Hilarious. Now, on that note, however, this episode does have a few moments talking about death and the darker side of humanity, so if there are any young children around, or if you yourself aren't up for that kind of thing, please do consider this your moment to maybe skip to the next episode. Welcome to the fantastic history of food. Strange but true stories from history that in some way involve food. I'm your host, Nick Charlie Key. We start our stories today in March of 1519 at the Roman villa of Lorenzo Strozzi. Guests were arriving to attend a lavish banquet at the home of the wealthy banker in celebration of the carnival feast, one last excess before the season of Lent began in the lead up to Easter. They had all attended banquets at Strozzi's home before and knew what to expect. Rich meats, free flowing wines, delectable sweet treats and a few sculptures made from spun sugar. So, it was maybe no small surprise then when they entered the home's grounds and found that, barring one solitary candle illuminating the stairs up to the home, no other lights shone anywhere in the house. Guests looked curiously at one another with no small amount of trepidation and slowly made their way up the stairs and through a large black door into a dimly lit room beyond. To their horror, Instead of fine meats, cheeses and wines, they were confronted with a long black table, lit with flickering candles and covered from end to end with skulls and skeletons, with the centerpiece being one giant skull propped up by a circle of thigh bones. Just as some guests began looking for a way to escape this nightmare, Strozzi himself entered the room with a flourish and in a loud voice proclaimed, Ladies and gentlemen, eat! Now, no one moved. And why would they? Was this a trick? Had the man lost his mind? Now, in the silence that followed, two Catholic cardinals became overwhelmed with terror and expelled the contents of their stomachs. Just when his guests could take no more, Strozzi himself moved towards the enormous centerpiece and, with a small hammer, brought it down swiftly upon the giant skull, cracking it open and revealing beneath a plump, roast pheasant, surrounded by sausages. His guests realized it was all one large macabre practical joke at their expense, and the mood in the room began to lighten. It was all revealed to be fake bones hiding other delicious treats. In the days and weeks to follow, reports would write that there had never been such a wonderful supper in all of Rome, and surely none as costly, but equally none as terrifying. The only problem with that statement was that it was wholly incorrect. In the historical writings of Dio Cassius, he describes a similarly horrific banquet hosted by the Roman Emperor Domitian in the year 89. Domitian has gone down in history for two very specific reasons. Firstly, he is remembered as the emperor who rebuilt Rome. Great, but rather more unflatteringly, he is also remembered for his exceptional cruelty and violence. And so, armed with that knowledge, we dive into the story of his very own Black Banquet. Domitian had invited a large group of aristocratic couples to what was meant to be a lavish banquet at his palace on top of the Palatine Hill. When they arrived, however, at the appointed place and at the appointed time, they were ushered into a large room, decorated once again entirely in black. Now, I'm talking black marble floors, black paint on the walls, black velvet drapes, And to top it all off, the only light that lit the room was from oil lamps, usually reserved specifically for funerals. In the gloom ahead of them, the guests could make out individual seats for each of them, usually soft and comfortable couches, but in this instance, solid stone benches. 
To make matters worse, next to each bench was the name of one of the guests. No, not on a piece of paper or anything so mundane, but rather carved into a gravestone. At this point, the guests were understandably terrified. Domitian's reputation was well known. He had previously ordered the execution of many senators in the past, and the guests all came to believe that they had each individually, in some way or another, slighted him, and this was his way of letting them know that none of them were going to make it out alive. As they stood trembling, unsure of what to do, a group of slaves appeared, painted head to toe in black paint, carrying trays of food that itself had been dyed black, resting on pitch black onyx plates. Suddenly, from the back of the room, boomed the voice of Domitian himself. He did nothing to assuage their fears, however, and began to speak morbidly about death, decay, and the inevitable end that every man and woman must one day face. The guests were ushered to their stone benches and served food usually given to spirits of the underworld as offerings for dead relatives. They were now all certain that they had been summoned to this banquet as an elaborate means by which to execute them all. Domitian droned on all throughout the meal about death, battle and slaughter until suddenly he stopped and told his guests abruptly it was now time for them to leave. He instructed the guests that he had arranged for black litters carried by his slaves to usher them all home and none were allowed to refuse. As they slowly climbed aboard their slave-drawn seats, they were sure they were going to be led down a dark alley somewhere and dispatched by royal assassins. But to their surprise, they were all safely delivered back to their very own doorsteps and left there to continue on with what I can only imagine would be a lifelong PTSD. The next morning, doors all across the city were knocked upon by messengers of the emperor. The guests, presumably having not slept a wink the night before, opened them up to see that the emperor had sent them all a gift bag. Included in it was their very own gravestone, washed to reveal that it had been crafted from pure silver. The expensive black onyx plates from which they had eaten, and most confusingly of all, one of the slaves from the previous night, who had now been washed and doused in perfume, ready to serve their new masters. It turned out to be all one big sociopathic game for Emperor Domitian at the expense of his noble friends. It seems that Domitian's black banquet had been somewhat of an inspiration for Strozzi when he conceived of his very own practical joke dinner but it was simply one of many themed banquets that would be held in the Renaissance era in what came to be known as competitive banqueting. In the 16th century, a group of wealthy artists from Florence known as the Company of the Trowel took this idea one step further. They invited guests to attend a banquet where, upon arrival, they were met by an actor portraying Pluto, the god of the underworld, who then ushered them inside to join him at a feast celebrating his recent marriage to a woman he was holding captive against her will. He beckoned them through a grand door designed to look like the jaws of an enormous snake with the fangs protruding down precariously close to people's heads as they stooped through. And to make this even more terrifying, the door had been mechanized so that at some points it could be made to snap shut as some guests passed through it. As the guests entered the room beyond, they were met with images lining the walls of the underworld and of people being tortured. An actor, dressed as the devil, poured wine and ushered them to the table which had seemingly been overrun by disgusting and repulsive creatures. There were snakes, lizards, scorpions and spiders, which in the dimly lit banquet hall looked remarkably real. However, just like Strozzi, each of these terrifying creatures were merely vessels in which other, more palatable foods resided. The snakes, spiders and scorpions were made from marzipan and then painted to look real, but were simply there to be cracked open to reveal lark, thrush, veal and other rich dark meats. To finish the meal, guests were served cookies shaped to resemble human bones. One of today's sponsors is Athletic Greens. So what is Athletic Greens? Well, with one delicious scoop of Athletic Greens, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, your recovery, your focus, and aging. 
And best of all, it's lifestyle friendly. So whether you follow a keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free or gluten-free diet, Athletic Greens fits into all of them. It costs less than $3 a day. And for every purchase, Athletic Greens donates to organizations helping to get nutritious food to kids in need, including No Kid Hungry in the US. In 2020 alone, Athletic Greens donated over 1.2 million meals to kids. Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with a convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash emerging. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash E-M-E-R-G-I-N-G to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. I've discovered a new podcast that I really think you'll all love as much as I do. It's called the 10-ish podcast. In each episode, they cover a different top 10 list. But it's not always exactly the top 10, it's usually 10-ish. It's a comedy podcast that helps listeners to learn new things and to laugh while doing so. No matter what your interests are, they'll have a list to meet your needs. So for fans of this show, they have lists about food and history, but also true crime, pop culture, and so much more. If you're looking to start with some food-related lists, why not check out their episodes on the most popular breakfast cereals, the highest calorie meals, or maybe even the most consumed animals. You can find them at 10ishpod.com. That's the number 10, I-S-H, pod.com or on all of the major podcast apps. We fast forward now 200 years, and we come to the famous French gourmand, Alexander Balthazar Laurent Grimaud de la Reniere. I hope I pronounced that right, but more commonly known, thankfully, simply as Grimaud. It was the year 1812, and we join the story at a rather sad and unfortunate time as Madame Grimaud, his wife, is sending out invitations to his funeral. The invitations themselves were enormous, being almost two feet in length and printed on black-edged paper. The message inscribed inside read as follows. Madame Grimaud de la Reniere is humbled and saddened to inform you of the recent and painful loss of her husband. The funeral will take place this very day, Tuesday, July 7th, with a convoy of people departing for the mortuary from the residence on the Champs-Élysées at precisely 4pm. It was a massively shocking announcement that sent ripples of surprise and anguish through the Parisian high society, as Grimaud had not been ill and wasn't even particularly old. Even stranger than that was the fact that the funeral was set for that very day the invitations were delivered. And worse still, the departure time was so close to dinner. The timing of this was even more notable, given that Grimaud had made his name in Paris and beyond as the author of The Almanac des Gourmandes, a series of eight books which essentially served as the world's first restaurant guide. He, of all people, knew the value of a good dinner and would have hated to deprive his friends of their meal on his account. Maybe it was no surprise then that due to this fact and the very rushed nature of having it on the same day, the number of people who arrived at the appointed time to pay their respects was embarrassingly small. When they arrived at the house, they were ushered inside, where almost every surface was draped in heavy black cloth, and there, in the middle of the hall, sat Grimaud's coffin, illuminated on either side by a row of candles. As the guests waited for the hearse to arrive to collect the coffin, they began to reminisce about their friend and his many virtues. After a short time, a strange creaking noise could be heard, and as everyone turned to see where it was coming from, the coffin lid was flung open, and up sat Grimaud, who, with a devilish smile on his face, proudly announced that dinner was served. At his word, two large doors were opened to reveal an extraordinarily long table piled high with delicious food and lit by hundreds of candles. Grimaud announced that he had gathered his guests in this way in order to reveal who his true friends were, and astonishingly, it seems he may already have had some insight, as when the guests made their way to the table, there were exactly the right number of chairs there waiting for them. 
He was quoted as saying, there's no better way to test the mettle of a true friend than to see who would come to my funeral, especially when it means missing dinner. It seems that Grimaud's need for validation and love from his friends was born out of a childhood that was fraught with bullying and ridicule. Despite growing up in lavish surroundings, we all know that money can't buy happiness, and so it was for young Grimaud. He was the son of a wealthy Parisian tax collector whom he would grow up to utterly despise. Grimaud was born with a rare condition that caused his hands and fingers to be deformed and as a child, his parents did their best to keep him out of sight to hide their own embarrassment. When he grew old enough that he could no longer be hidden, his parents began to fear that should people see his hands, they might question the strength of their family's bloodline. So, to make sure this never happened, they began telling anyone who would listen that poor Grimaud, as a young baby, had fallen into a pig pen and the hogs inside had began eating his hands before he could be rescued by his parents. His hands would eventually be amputated fully and replaced with, for a time, a pair of ingenious metal prostheses hidden beneath white gloves. His friends really should have known better on the day, as this wasn't the first time Grimaud had done something like this. A few years before, he had sent out 300 invitations to Parisian high society to attend a banquet at his home overlooking the Champs-Élysées, and one that was described as excruciatingly chic. When the 300 guests arrived at this address, almost all of them were herded to one side, while just around 30 guests were ushered into a secondary waiting room with a checkpoint. Here at this checkpoint, they were asked a simple question. Were they here to see the defender of the people or the oppressor of the people? Those who answered correctly were ushered into the third and final room lit with exactly 365 candles. Not stopping there, the already livid guests who had been kept outside the house were finally ushered inside. Oh, no, not into the main banquet hall itself. No, they were led up to a balcony overlooking the feast and the chosen few who were permitted to dine. They were served no food other than a few biscuits to tide them over, and they were also not permitted to leave before Grimaud gave his say-so. They were instructed simply to observe. Below them, as the night progressed, Grimaud treated his lucky few guests to coffee, liqueur, and a magic lantern show. Eventually, one man from above lost his cool and shouted down to Grimaud that he would have him sent to a madhouse and see to it personally that Grimaud was struck from the bar. Grimaud only smiled and continued his little game. Naturally, this made him the talk of the town, and he would begin throwing more and more lavish parties at his house. For the very reason that no one knew what he was going to do, invitations to his parties were worth more than gold, even with the inherent risks of being held captive on a balcony. At another party, he served only black foods in the form of truffles, chocolates, plums and caviar, while at another he had a live pig brought in, dressed in his despised father's clothes, and he sat it in his father's chair. These parties were the first inklings of his burgeoning love of food, entertainment and parties and would be the catalyst for his stellar career as a food critic, from which he would ultimately write his eight-volume restaurant guide. It was, however, his fake funeral stunt that would mark the end of his partying ways in Paris, as after he was done hosting it, he and his wife retired for good to a quieter life in the countryside. So, now, you have no excuses for when you are hosting your next dinner party not to liven it up in some way or other, although keeping 90% of your guests hostage for the entire meal probably isn't one of the first ones I'd try out. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Fantastic History of Food. If you'd like to get in touch, you can find us on Twitter at Food History Pod. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate you taking a moment to rate the show on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you listen on, and if you can, leave a review as well. I also have a Patreon account where you can support the show and get access to exclusive content, bonus episodes, and even the chance to choose the topic for an upcoming episode. But all of this is only for our Patreon subscribers. Everyone who donates or subscribes will also get a personal shout-out from me on an upcoming episode. 
check out our website where you can find transcripts, show notes, and references for each and every episode at foodhistorypodcast.com. 